You're listening to WorkSites, insights about the American workplace, workplace law, and the future of work. This podcast is produced by The Noble Law, an employment law firm with offices across the United States, and is hosted by managing partner Laura Noble, a recognized leader in employment law with over 20 years of diverse legal experience. This podcast is not intended to be used as legal advice and does not establish an attorney-client relationship with its listeners. I am delighted to introduce today's guest for our podcast. We have Dr. Tracy McCubbin with us to discuss menopause and the challenges that women have in the workplace who are experiencing menopausal symptoms. She started her career in emergency medicine in Denver, Colorado, and went to Kaiser Centers for Complementary Medicine in 2003. In 2019, she opened her private practice, Radiance Functional Medicine, and she sees patients from all over the country for a variety of health concerns, including hormone balancing, digestive disorders, fertility, autoimmune conditions, and healthy aging. Dr. McCubbin is board certified in emergency medicine, integrative medicine, and in functional medicine. She uses a combination of her education and experience when treating patients. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tracy. Oh, hi, Laura. Thank you so much for having me. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk about a topic that is so near and dear to my heart. Menopause is something that all women between ages 45 and 55 are going to go through, and yet there seems to be an incredible dearth of information about what that experience is like. So tell us from your medical perspective, what can women expect as they experience menopause? Well, as as you mentioned, um, Laura, menopause is about a 10 to 12 year process for most women. Um, and the issues come up because the ovary doesn't sort of shut down production in this nice linear fashion. Um, the hormone levels can fluctuate widely uh, over that 10 to 12 year period. So some of the symptoms are because of low hormone levels and some of the symptoms are because of fluctuating levels. Um, but sequentially, if we sort of look at and go in order, uh, one of the first complaints that we see in that early part of perimenopause is insomnia. And sleep deprivation in and of itself, you know, can certainly affect workplace performance. And, you know, it's not always necessarily how much estrogen you have or how much progesterone you have, but it's the ratio. So they kind of dance. So when you become relatively estrogen dominant, those mood swings and irritability can be difficult for a woman to recognize and even more difficult to control. And then from, you know, us girls, we make just a little bit of testosterone, but it's pretty important. And when that starts to decline, you lose that sense of self and sense of direction, sometimes lacking motivation and just that kind of drive that has been a part of their lives for so long. And then last but not least, when that estrogen starts to decline, which is a little bit later generally in that time period, in that decade, you start getting those hot flashes, um, those temperature regulation issues. And a lot of what we call brain fog, you know, there's the forgetfulness, uh, the just inability to concentrate somewhere between the estrogen and testosterone. That's kind of the case. And then from a cosmetic standpoint, of course, um, hair thinning, hair loss and the weight gain that occurs uh, can make a lot of women very self-conscious and that can affect their self-confidence in a big way. In your experience, do women who have these menopausal side effects or symptoms, do do those get misdiagnosed frequently? I, you know, I think uh, somewhat misdiagnosed, but a lot of times just kind of overlooked and swept under the rug. I think many traditional allopathic physicians will just say, gosh, you got to just tough this out. You you know, it'll, it'll be a few years, but everything will be fine. And I think a big reason for that is because many physicians are operating off of somewhat old data. Uh, There was a Back before 2002, it was pretty common to prescribe um, estrogen in particular to relieve some of the symptoms of menopause. And there was a big study that came out, the Women's Health Initiative, um, that basically said we have to stop estrogen because we're killing women. We're giving them, you know, breast cancer and heart attacks and possibly increased risk of stroke. And the problem with that study is that it was using a synthetic oral 
progesterone, actually progestogen and estrogen combination that I definitely agree, you know, was very dangerous. But in the ensuing years, a lot of data has come out around the safety of uh, topical bioidentical hormones. So I think there, there is a way to help women through that process. Do you think there's also some a stigma on women who choose to take hormone replacement therapy? Well, again, if the physician is operating on some of that old data, I think there could be, you know, oh, you're going to increase your risk. And that's always puts a little bit of fear in people's hearts. And certainly it's, you know, it depends on your medical history, your family history, your genetics. I mean, there's a lot of reasons to decide to or not to uh, take hormone replacement. But my take has really always been that hormones are about more than just reproduction. I think in the year 1900, we only lived to about the age of 49. We didn't even quite even make it to menopause, you know? And these days with all the advances in modern medicine and technology, the average lifespan of a woman, I think in 2021 was like 81 years old. And in my opinion, I think we need those hormones around for just a little bit longer um, to protect our heart, to protect our bones, to protect our brain from cognitive decline. Now, how would you explain this difference between men and women aging? Because I sometimes I, I feel like people will respond, well, you know, men also have some cognitive declines or lack of drive in 45 to 55. So, so why is this particularly affecting women or does it affect them more? Well, and I think that's probably the perspective sometimes of male physician. <laughs> Men are fortunate. Uh, those boys, they shut down production of testosterone in a nice linear fashion that is very gradual. So although they do have andropause, uh, which is what the male version would be called, it's much milder and it's not nearly as noticeable, let's say. So Tracy, we talked earlier about how some doctors misdiagnose menopause but I think for some women in perimenopause, they may themselves not understand that they're, what they're experiencing are premenopausal symptoms. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, so it's very interesting. I think many women will think, oh yeah, my mom or my older sister, you know, that happened around 50. And the age range is incredibly variable. I have people, I have women in their late thirties that are starting down the perimenopause path. Some people, certainly by the time you're in your mid forties, but there's a little bit of that gray area and the, it seems to be coming earlier and earlier. And that has to do with toxins in the environment. Um, you know, it's uh, when a woman leaves her house in the morning to go to work, it said that she has up to 127 different chemicals on her body. And many of those are endocrine disruptors. So we're seeing a lot of what's called premature ovarian failure. You know, we're seeing it earlier and earlier. So a lot of times that's happening in those early phases and women are just not aware because they don't think, oh my gosh, I'm not going through menopause. You know, that can't, this can't be starting already. You know, I'm too young. And they don't recognize that kind of difference. And a lot of times it starts subtly. And so it's not as, as obvious to either, you know, the woman or her physician. And in what ways would a woman potentially be misdiagnosed? Well, I think the fatigue is something that we see, the insomnia. So many people have trouble sleeping um, that I think that can just be sort of glossed over. And I think the irritability and mood swings, yeah, a lot of times the things that are prescribed maybe to treat that aren't necessarily the things that we need. Like sleep medications or antidepressants? Antidepressants, a lot of times... So in Europe, St. John's Ward, a combination of St. John's Ward and Black Cohosh has been used very effectively. And then in the earlier phases, even with progesterone support of Vitex Agnes Cactus, a uh, herbal supplement, and they tend to look at it early and start early with mild things and then move up. One of the antidepressants can help with the vasomotor symptoms of the hot flashes. Um, there's been some data to kind of show that. And then that anxiety, depression feeling from those mood swings, an antidepressant a lot of times be used. And it's not particularly effective, I think, for, for what we're dealing with. Interesting. So from my perspective as a woman in her 50s and, a, and an employment attorney, uh, I am astonished that we don't, as a nation, have an ongoing dialogue about this and any particular protections in place for women in the workplace who are suffering from menopause symptoms. Have you had patients come to you who, who've had to, who've had difficulties at work as uh, connected to their menopause symptoms? 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and difficulties at home. And when you get into difficulties at home, you're going to have difficulties at work as well. I mean, it affects, I think, all aspects of our life. And, you know, when you look at where um, so many women are waiting until later in life to have children, by the time they're going through menopause, you know, they call it the sandwich generation, right? You're dealing sometimes with young kids and teenagers, and you're also dealing with aging parents. So you have a lot of pressures on you besides just what's going on in the workplace. Right. And during that time, you yourself are also experiencing these menopausal symptoms. Oh, yeah. And and not nearly as functional as you might have been the decade before. Right. It's also notable that that's exactly the time for many of us that we're reaching the peak of our leadership and management capabilities, right? That we've been in the workplace now for 20 or 30 years. We've become subject matter experts in a particular field. And now we're moving into positions of leadership. And then all of a sudden our body betrays us with these menopause symptoms that we then don't talk about with anyone. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it can affect uh, a woman's career from that standpoint. Just as you said, that's the time um, to be solidifying everything. And instead, I feel like a lot of women say, okay, throw in the towel, time to retire. Well, and there's this intersection between inherent biases in the workplace around aging uh, individuals uh, inherent gender discrimination against w- women who age because we're still judged uh, significantly on our appearance. Uh, and then, you know, a, a discrimination around disability accommodations, right? So going to your boss and saying, I can't sleep at night and I'm having hot flashes and I need some accommodations for that is incredibly scary because, you you know, you're going to then put that target on your back that, hey, boss, I'm this old aging woman. (laughs) No, it's not And, uh, and, and pass over me for this and that. No, I think it's, you know, not to underestimate the message that women get from the media, Uh, you know, whether it's, you know, the magazines or social media or what's on the television. I mean, it's, you know, a lot, a number of my patients feel like it, they're losing their youth. You know, it's the loss of youth. And I think admitting that, um, especially trying to explain that to a, a male boss um, or a male superior is, is very uncomfortable for women. And, and there is still many stereotypes that exist that folks seemingly feel free to discuss in the workplace, Uh, you know, that of course she's, uh, oh gosh, she might be having a hot flash. Stay away. She's going to be crazy. She's going to lose it. Like in a way that you wouldn't talk about somebody with a different disability, right? Mm -hmm. That that's still somehow uh, acceptable or appropriate in the workplace. I think women really, really, it takes a lot of extra effort to sort of hide those things. Right. Um, from the rest of the world. So somehow, you know, it's almost a, a bit of being inauthentic or, you, you know, not really being able to be yourself because you've got this big secret that you're trying to hide. Right. Exactly. And you're probably struggling internally with your own changes that are affecting your cognitive ability, your sleep, your ability to focus. Right. There's, I, I imagine, a part of you that is, is, angry or frustrated, disappointed that your your body's sort of betraying you in this way, but that you've always been able to function in a certain way, you know, sleep eight hours, drive, 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 and all of a sudden that's not accessible to you anymore and you can't talk to anyone about it. Right. So the thing that I hear over and over again is, you know, the really successful career women who say, you know, I would have my list of things to do and I would get through it every day. And now I'm, the list is just getting longer and longer because I can no longer get through it. And they don't really understand why, you you know, the, this, the fatigue and the brain fog and the, um, you know, lack of energy or sense of purpose or direction that so often comes along during this time. And, and it is, you know, like, who am I? And getting to sort of learn yourself again or understand, or how can I work through this? Right. And right. Mental, a mental mindset, you know, is, and, and it's interesting to know too, that some women 
uh, don't experience as many symptoms because either their body's not as sensitive to the fluctuations or they don't fluctuate as widely. So, you know, if you take 10 different women, they're going to have 10 different sets of symptoms. And on a scale of one to 10, you know, it's going to affect them differently. And how much it affects their, you know, work and home life can vary quite a bit. It really is an, un an underlooked at area that I hadn't uh, heretofore really thought about. I mean, I work with the patients, but I don't, oh, and I hear about what's going on, but I don't necessarily think about that. And you're right, we do so much, you know, women have worked so hard, I think, to push through around pregnancy um, and around, you know, fertility issues and time off for that, because so much of that's happening. That's a whole nother podcast probably. But, um, but yeah, menopause, it didn't really occur to me. And I was saying this to someone the other day, like, I have been an employment lawyer for I don't even know how long, and an, and an attorney and a, and a woman in the workplace for 30 years, it never occurred to me that this is not an area that has any protections at all, that has that we don't discuss, that's completely taboo, that's completely stigmatized, that's still open for mockery. How is that possible when every, if you had a society where every man from the age of 45 to 55 had a medical condition I truly believe that we would have some policies in place to to address those. For men, you know, we have a total testosterone and a free testosterone. So you get what's available and circulating to tissues, right? For women, we just have the estrogen and progesterone. And so it doesn't take into account what is bound to sex hormone binding globulin. So you don't get a free estrogen or a free progesterone. And it's just got another example of how men kind of rule the world, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, if the go down, it's a tragedy, right? It's a, it's a complete crisis. And for women, we just, we don't, maybe we just don't have enough of a voice for ourselves. So one thing we didn't talk about is uh, health insurance coverage, because most employees get their health insurance from their employers. And I believe that most employer-based health insurance plans don't cover hormone replacement therapy. They do not. And interestingly enough, they do for men. If you've got hypogonadism or if you have low T, low testosterone, whatever, there is, you know, multiple different options from creams and gels to injections. And men can even inject themselves. They don't even necessarily have to go to the doctor. But women, by and large, they're not covering. They will can cover the synthetic birth control pill, which we know will hurt a woman, um, but they will not cover the safer bioidentical forms. And many, even of the pharmaceutical companies with the uh, estrogen patches, um, they won't be covered by insurance. Okay. That makes me furious. Yes. Why? What is the possible rationale for that other than just blatant gender bias? You know, they will not even draw a woman's hormones during what? menopause or when they're on hormone replacement. They, the insurance, the company will uh, often not cover that. You know, they'll let you draw them once and then they need to be rechecked at six months or a year. They will not cover that. And I've never seen them not cover a testosterone for a man. Because I had a clinical integrative medicine practice for five years and I was doing quite a bit of this and I would have to get on the phone and complain that a woman needs her hormones checked after she starts treatment. And it was just falling on deaf ears. That's why a lot of these companies, you know, the integrative functional medicine have put into place like saliva testing, because that does test tissue levels for if you're on topical hormones, it's a much better way to draw or they have blood spot. But again, insurance companies most of the time don't cover that. Some insurances do. So I'm really struggling to understand this. Why do they think that testosterone is medically necessary, but estrogen is not? It's a very good question. <laughs> There's no testosterone available for women. I mean, most physicians won't even check free and total testosterone on women. You know, again, we make so little, but when I see a woman at a zero and you replace a little, she feels like she's on top of the world after about six weeks. You know, it's a huge game changer. And a lot of insurance companies won't even cover checking testosterone on a woman. What are the symptoms that men experience if they have low testosterone? That's oh, that's a very interesting discussion that we could get into because we're seeing a lot more 
low testosterone in younger and younger men. And I've had this discussion with some of the cardiologists, everybody and their brothers going on a statin medication, right? So statins are going to lower your cholesterol. Well, to make your sex hormones, right, you need cholesterol as the precursor. And if a man's testosterone gets, I mean, a man's cholesterol gets down below 140, he's not going to make testosterone. So all this erectile dysfunction that we're seeing in the world has a lot to do with this overprescribing of statin medications. And correct me if I'm wrong, but erectile dysfunction is covered by health insurance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and and are there not 10 pharmaceutical companies that are going to make their Dialis and Viagra? And, oh, there's all kinds of options out there for men when their parts don't work the way they want them to. Not to mention, okay, you're going to probably want to edit this out. But if we're just talking about sex functions, you know, vaginal dryness and sensitivity and, you know, a thinning of the lining, how is that any different from erectile dysfunction? Oh, it's not it, at all. It's, I mean, it's much worse because if, even if you want to argue from insurance coverage from a medical perspective, when you start getting vaginal dryness and you start getting atrophic vaginitis and you get urethral irritation, you're going to get more urinary tract infections and potentially more vaginal infections. And it's incredibly painful if it goes on to, um, to become very severe. And, and if, and if a woman was on a medically covered hormone replacement therapy, she would have less of those symptoms. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the best uh, treatment for that is an estriol vaginal cream that is not really available in traditional allopathic medicine. You have to get it compounded through a compounding pharmacy. And they're, in general, never covered, maybe 20% of the time covered by certain insurance companies. And I think it takes a woman a lot of finagling uh, to make that happen. And from an employment law perspective, this kind of inherent bias can have really major consequences to women in this age group. So, and that implicit bias can come from men and from women. As you said, if there are women who've gone through menopause that haven't had those kind of symptoms, they may lack empathy, understanding of the woman who is and may have some bias towards her that, that translates into get over it, tough it out, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. What do you, you know, I did, I was tough. Why can't you be? Um, and what I would like to see if it was we're moving into talking about solutions, I would like to see greater transparency and discussion of what happens to women in menopause and menopausal policies in place, right? So we have pregnancy and maternity and paternity and childcare policies, all of which I applaud, but not every man or woman is going to become a parent, but every woman aged 45 to 55 is going to go through menopause, everyone. And yet we don't, it's just this medical mystery that we don't talk about and we gloss over. It kind of boggles my mind. Well, and over and over again, when I explain to my patient that it's a 10 to 12 year process, you know, that this is, you know, it's just the look of, oh no, what am I going to do? You know, they don't, they don't even realize that it's not something that's just going to be overnight or last a year or so, you know, it's going to go on for a while. And I think opening up the discussion would be, um, so much more helpful and policies in place would be wonderful. I would have liked to have seen those. And in the vein of authenticity and transparency, I will share with you that I went through uh, menopause, had menopausal symptoms at a time when I was really working on growing and expanding the law firm. And the insomnia and brain fog was so overwhelming that I came to the conclusion that I could not run the firm with these symptoms and that I, I sought treatment and I ended up uh, going on a hormone replacement therapy program literally to save the firm because there was no way that I could work at that schedule on four hours of sleep and, and lacking focus. But again, I didn't share that with my partners. I didn't share that with my, you know, management team. It's, it was, it was a completely private and almost stigmatized thing that actually is just the natural part of aging that we will all experience. And it's interesting that you say I had was more of a uh, in more of a corporate uh, position um, before I went out to start my private practice and I experienced 
you know, some of the very same symptoms and um, very same attitudes and belief that we're talking about today. So some of the things that I would like to see that I think would be helpful are a more defined understanding of accommodations, particularly around menopausal symptoms, right? So I'm not sure that under the current laws of the American Disabilities Act that menopause would even be considered a disability that would uh, require an employer to engage in conversations about accommodations. Oh, I don't think so at all. And so if you're a, a menopausal woman and you're having hot flashes and insomnia and brain fog and mood swings, and you are requiring or you're seeking your employer to give you an accommodation, I'm not sure that the law is going to provide that for you as it currently stands. Have you had patients who've, who've asked for those kinds of accommodations at work and have been denied? I think you know, part of the the early issues, from my perspective, are going to be get, getting women to recognize it and be able to talk about it and be able to feel comfortable to ask for those things. I don't, I don't think that happens. Yeah, so I agree. I think that the concept of asking for an accommodation for your medical symptoms related to menopause is probably a completely alien concept to most women in the workplace. And to be able to do that, they probably do need support from their physician, um, from their you know primary care provider, physician, nurse practitioner, or what have you, to be able to do that. And I think you know maybe some of the education is going to need to begin with physicians. Oh, absolutely, I agree. But but also in the workplace to understand that things like flexible schedules or you know time to take breaks when you're having a hot flash periods of time where maybe you're moving on to less stressful projects until you you know your your hormones are more regulated in a way uh, I think those are all reasonable accommodations that would not be overly burdensome for most employers but again there has to be an avenue to get those meaning that women have to feel confident that they can go to their employers and ask for them and not be targeted by you know pointing out the obvious that I'm an aging woman in the workplace the other issue that is, particularly vexing for me on this topic, is that age discrimination has a higher burden of proof than other t- forms of discrimination. So put another way, it's harder to prove age discrimination than it is to prove other types of discrimination. And that creates just one more barrier to older women in the workplace who are trying to seek equity and equality for their work. So I would love to see that as something that we would move on and, and revise as we're as we're looking at this issue about menopause. Yeah, I think our society as a whole it tends to not respect, I think, aging as well as maybe some other societies do. And I think particularly when that becomes to women and men, somehow when you get that kind of gray hair, um, you elevate in stature. And women, I think it's not true. And whether this is all a part of that picture. No, I think that's absolutely right. And I think in many ways, it's easier in the workplace to discuss pregnancy accommodations because there's this fertility aspect to it that's very evolutionarily appealing, right? Mm -hmm. But the idea that you're going through a process that means you will not be able to have babies anymore is sort of icky for people to think about and it makes them uncomfortable and we don't really want to talk about women who can't have babies anymore. So it becomes something very taboo in the workplace. Right. Evolutionary. That's if that's the role of the female, then when that role's finished, what is your role? And I how that I mean in this day and age how that rolls over, but I think it's still there on some level. Absolutely. And I think women feel it too. You know, I think there's there's a lot you know, a lot of my patients when they've when they've needed to have a hysterectomy, and how that just really affects them uh, mentally, emotionally, psychologically. At first, it's something you have to deal with because that's like your center and the sort of ramifications around that. Yeah, such an interesting discussion. Absolutely. Do you feel hopeful that we're moving in a direction where women will be more confident in the workplace to talk about menopausal symptoms? Well, we're we're unearthing so many things, I think, around the workplace, as you mentioned. So many things uh, are more open uh, for discussion. So I think educating women on this topic is a big first step. And then educating employers. 
that's the second big step. <laughs> <laughs> and then changing the laws. So we, we've got a we've got a lot on our plate, Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> so wh- what would you say to women who are in their 30s, 40s, 50s, who have kind of a, a variety of symptoms, uh, you know, the fatigue, the insomnia, the hot flashes, the irritability? Well, it's interesting. You know, I always talk about our hormones in general as uh, symphony. If you knock out the percussion section, right, the music doesn't sound pretty and you need to rebalance. You need to look at adrenal health and thyroid health along with the sex hormones. So it's a, a much bigger evaluation, I think, than we often, than, than traditional allopathic medicine is often providing. And what impact does stress have on these symptoms? Oh, it's, it, it's, incredible. <laughs> the, uh, just uh, the change in what I was seeing in my practice during COVID was um, pretty profound. It's um, It was so stressful on so many levels, so many people, and some people are really in touch with themselves and they they knew they were feeling stress. Um, others were just saying, oh, it's not affecting me at all, which probably was a little bit more dangerous, but just kind of what was going on. And the uptick in symptoms um, and then what stress can just do to our overall physiology. And we have a lot of it now. Our society is, there. there's a lot more on our plate. You know, I always use the example of you might have, there's so many ways to reach you, right? You have email and you have social media accounts and you have uh, cell phones and you might have, you know, one for work and one for home of each one of those things. It's just practicing mindfulness and having that downtime can really help a woman sail through menopause in a much happier fashion. But I can also see how the stress of our modern life and of women in positions of leadership between 45 and 55 uh, and working in a corporate culture, oftentimes, which is a male dominated corporate culture, going through menopause might just throw up their hands and say, I'm out, I'm done. This is too much. It's not worth it. Uh, and I think that's a lot of times when they leave the corporate world and do their venture, you know, start their own business, uh, do something else. I have three patients that come to mind who are attorneys <laughs> who have left that world at, at right around 45 uh, to 48 years old to do something different. And while I applaud female entrepreneurs and in you know, a changing of careers, I do worry about the impact on our society when we're losing these highly skilled women, knowledgeable women in the workplace, because we fail to accommodate what happens to all of us, which is menopause. This has really opened my eyes. I mean, I think it's a a much bigger can of worms. I was thinking about it just from the medical perspective and not really thinking as much about it from the, you know, legal work standpoint. I mean, I give women layer. You know, when you're when you're going to work, you have on the tank top and you have a little sweater always and get a fan or get a little um, heater in the wintertime. I mean, it's the temperature regulation, I think, can be a, a huge issue. And when you're sweating bullets and have to go like try to blow dry in the bathroom, your sweat pits and your armpits and have to walk out of a meeting. I mean, I've had patients say, I just I can't, you know, I can't work. I just saw a dentist like two weeks ago, that's still wearing all the PPE. And she's like, God help me. I mean, the sweat, the hot flashes were bad before, but now I've got all this protective equipment on me. I can't stand it. I mean, I can't work. And again, because of the stigma around that, if if it was a disability associated with kidney failure or liver failure or cancer, folks would be empathetic and talk about it and more likely to say, of course, you know, take time, take 20 minutes after the meeting, but we're sneaking around in the bathroom, searching for fans and not telling anybody and why we have to change anybody. our shirts. I have one person to tell me insane. she brings a blow dryer to work so that she can go in and try to dry herself off if she's got an important meeting to go to. That was prior to seeing me, not after she saw me, but that's what she was currently doing. She's like, I think I got to do something about that. Also, it's, you know, one in eight women are going to develop breast cancer. And we're seeing it earlier and earlier. Toxins in the environment, endocrine disruptors, that's a whole big part of that. And of course, our standard American diet is not helping us. But, um, you know, after a woman goes through treatment for breast cancer, she's in menopause. 
I mean, they're, you know, we're blocking all of her estrogen and not allowing her to have any progesterone or testosterone as well. So talk about vaginal dryness there. And, you know, it's been, many oncologists are now coming around to, you know, the 38 year old who you're forcing into early menopause. I mean, give her some estriol vaginal cream so she can still have sex with her husband, you know? I mean, it's, it's really an issue, but that's a whole nother part of the population that's in menopause and they definitely don't talk about it. And in that, you know, 38 year old example of the woman who has breast cancer and now has personality changes, mood swings, vaginal dryness, it, you know, it, less likely to have sex with her husband. If her husband had low T, you just go to his doctor and they'd cover it. And, they'd... and they would find a way. How long has Viagra been on the market? I right. mean, and it's covered, right, by insurance, Viagra. Definitely covered by insurance. We want men to continue to spread their seed. It's necessarily <laughs> important, right? To propagate the species. Don't right. let anything happen to that. But you'd go deal with your uterus issues away from us. Away we don't want to yeah, see you're that. Done. You're done reproducing. We don't care about you anymore. What advice would you give to women who are experiencing these issues? Goodness, I would say embrace where you are in your life and be willing to begin by talking with your physician and ideally a physician who's open to the whole gamut of this experience and probably someone who's been through it already because they're much more understanding and then be willing to kind of go on and broach that with your employer um, and be able to talk about that more comfortably. I think in this field, you know, media, I think we're bringing around a little bit, you know, the the new mantra kind of 50 is the new 30, that um, it's becoming a little bit more acceptable uh, to be uh, that a woman of age, let's say, um, but it's going to take all of us probably working together uh, to be able to change this. And I would add my two cents that women should speak to an employment attorney to yeah. make sure that they are documenting any discrimination that's happening, any failure to accommodate them that's happening, uh, and then speak to someone about how to alleviate those workplace difficulties. And thank you for having me. I, uh, I really enjoyed talking with you. And I think it's a, such an important topic. I'm glad to participate. Thank you. This has been WorkSites. You can learn more about Laura Noble and the Noble Law on LinkedIn, Facebook, or thenoblelaw.com. Thank you for listening.